convert it into their own AI, make AI bottom up rather than when AI right now is top down. In short, I think the workers and their uh, unions will have to be able to increase their power and influence the policies based on data. And that is with, and that's the human centered approach to data as well. Uh, we don't have to look at data based on robotics, based on AI, but you know, we have to bring in human centered approach uh, to work and human centered approach to data as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rima Ben. That's a perfect start, and, and I'm sure we'll, we'll talk more about, uh, about uh, data and why it is so critical, uh, given the fourth industrial revolution, that, that uh, the, the nature of work uh, will be shaped by, by that. Uh, Armin, can I go to you now? Yes, thank you very much, and it's an honor following Rima, so I'm glad I was late. Um, it's an honor to be invited by Alison, by Yogesh, and by Farouk, and by the Cody Institute to discuss with such wonderful students from around the world uh, what the future holds for workers. Um, my fellowship that I have with the Atkinson is called the Fellow on the Future of Workers. And I have to stress that every time I do a media interview because we often talk about the future of work without including the people doing the work in that discussion. So I really thank Rima for her focus and emphasis on a human-centered approach to the future of work. Here in the Global North, when we talk about the future of work, the most common conversation is the robots are gonna eat all of the jobs. And shortly after that is a conversation about basic income, neither of which situate people in the center of how the world of work will be unfolding. And, and the fact that Rima has re repeatedly focused on bargaining power is not only critical, uh, to understanding how we should be discussing the future of work and workers, but also how the future of work and workers will unfold if we seize the bargaining power that we naturally have. And so I want to spend just one moment talking about the biggest um, single force that is reshaping the future of work and workers around the planet, and that is the the force that it comes from demographics, from population aging. The entire global north is aging. The global south is nowhere near that um, trajectory of change, though fertility rates are dropping in the global south too, as women become more educated and choose not to have as many children. And that is something, women's education is something that is on everybody's international agenda. And as that happens, fertility rates fall. But in the global north, that happened very rapidly after what is colloquially called the baby boom, the explosion of fertility rates in the wake of the Second World War. And that shaped everything about labor markets in the uh, global north. And now as this bulge, of, you can think of it as a rabbit going through a python's body, right? Like as we go through time, this bulge of humanity that was born in the Second World War, just after the Second World War, moves through its formative years and then moves through the labor market and then exits the labor market. We're at the approximately in the middle phase of the exit uh, part in Canada. It's more advanced in Japan and China and South Korea. It's less advanced in the United States because of higher fertility rates of other groups. But what it is doing all over the global north is creating this phenomenon that people remark on, we're, we're remarking on all the time just before the pandemic, which is um, historically low unemployment rates. So finally, some of the uh, surplus labor was being soaked up because there were endemic global uh, labor and skills shortages in the global north, which has been sucking, like this, it's a push-pull dynamic with the global south, where there are fewer higher paid opportunities. Though technology might be changing that, and we, I'm sure we will get into that in, in our conversation. But I, I just want to stop for a moment on the demographics, pause on it, and really bring it home for you, because this is an opportunity to actually put flesh on the bones of the terms that 
um, mainstream international economic institutions like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. All these institutions are talking about in the need for inclusive growth. Rima was talking about the need for bottom-up data. Well, we need the, the, the need for bottom-up, boosting the economy from the bottom-up public policies uh, because we have had a 40-year dance with trickle-down theory, which is where you, you change the rules of the game so that there is more market, less government, and more powerful people have access to more money so they can do what made them powerful, which is to make money. And it is assumed that making money is connected to making jobs. That may or may not be true, but it certainly isn't true necessarily in a neighborhood near you in the global north. It has created a lot of jobs in emerging countries. That's a great thing, I guess, except so many of these jobs are so profoundly exploitative and done specifically to give the wealthy um, even more power, the wealthy and powerful even more power. So let us remember that at every turn of the conversation, what we are talking about is the potential for growing or declining bargaining power. And both are possible in the wake of the pandemic. As, as Rima said, the pandemic simply poured accelerant on a number of phenomena that were in place before, not only in terms of inequality and who was frozen out or sidelined from benefits of economic growth, but those who were permitted or encouraged to get in the game in the first place and how you were compensated once you were in the game. Uh, in the 1980s, Jesse Jackson had a very famous, uh, the Reverend Jesse Jackson in the United States had a very famous phrase, we had full employment under slavery too. So just having a job isn't good enough. Having a good job, which is what the ILO has been talking about, is the goal of the next hundred years of the international labor movement, is absolutely key. So we can't talk about basic income. We must talk about decent work because that's where the money for a basic in income or any income supports or social services that support a shrinking number of working age population around the world who lift up those who are too old, too young and too sick to work. But there are fewer of them every passing day to do that job. So we will need more public services for everybody. Those public services can be great jobs or terrible jobs if all we do is hand people money to find what they need on the market. So we need to be mindful of how we are shaping our own future, both in terms of paid and unpaid work, and in terms of who we will need to fill the endemic labor shortages uh, that we will be facing on the other side of the pandemic. I understand it is very difficult to think about this right now when we are talking about so many people that have been basically uh, put out to pasture uh, without any work at all or with not enough paid work to be able to survive. Um, and governments throughout the global north have been fairly generous with income supports, but now the pushback to cut back has started to emerge everywhere. So we need to be talking about what kind of work is essential to the essential economy. And I will close by saying, the essential economy has been revealed to be supported by the caring economy. That so much of what gets done uh, under the guise of GDP requires a robust social infrastructure. And currently a lot of that is unpaid and done by women. So when the pandemic hit and sidelined more women than men for the first time in any recession at all, what I dubbed the she session in uh, March, which was followed in Northern countries, the global North by a pretty rapid he covery, uh, we are still not recovering women's jobs. And we are still, while we call these people essential workers, the people that provide care to our oldest, our youngest and our sickest, we also underpay them by and large. Um, we pay childcare workers, for example, in Canada, less than we pay zookeepers. And that has been the case for over 50 years when we do pay them at all. So we do have a lot to discuss and I will wrap my comments now to entertain your questions and however Farouk and Yogesh wish to uh, advance this conversation. Thank you, thank you, Armin. I think that was a perfect start. I think the, the question of demographic is, is very, very uh, key. So let me let me begin from there and, and go to uh, Rima Ben. Uh, Rima Ben, uh, you, you started by saying uh, the informality and how significant that is uh, as of today, not just in India, 
uh, but uh, in, in Global South. So in, in our class, uh, Rima Ben, out of, uh, we have 31 participants from 12 countries and, and, and many from uh, Africa as well. <coughs> And, and you talked about the, the informality now, but also increasing informality. So looking at future of work, uh, can you just give us some idea? And, and Armin talked about uh, the, the aging population in the global north, but uh, uh, we have young population uh, in, uh, in, in the global south. Uh, last week, we had a speaker uh, from India talking about India needs to create 1 million jobs per month in order to, to meet the demand. So looking at informality, where do you see uh, the future, Rima Ben? The, the inf in, informality will continue to be like that or with, with technology, there'll be some formalization. And, and I mean, paint a picture of what is the reality of being an informal worker and, and how that may, and that may change in future or, or that will continue. Um, sure, Yogesh Bhai, thank you so much for <clears throat> asking me to paint the picture of the reality of the informal sector workers. And uh, I would say that when 93% of the workforce is in the informal sector, that is the mainstream. And I think uh, the pandemic brought that realization to the governments, to the policymakers, and to the corporations, to the multilaterals. And that's why everybody now wants inclusive but whose inclusion, including the formal sector into the development or excluding the formal sector, throwing them out to fend for themselves because informal sector is the mainstream now. And if we are the mainstream, then we have to carve out the path of growth and the path of development. And let me tell you what Armin Ben was saying. I fully agree to her that we, though it's very now very clear that, you know, you saw the largest exodus after independence in our country, in India, of the migrant workers. And I think, you know, penniless, without any payments, no money, no savings, returning back to their homes on foot for hundreds and hundreds of miles altogether with no food, no water. What a shame. What a shame for the country. What was the formal sector doing? Therefore, I say, and you would see that, you know, it was a non-violent march by these migrant workers. They did not do any rioting, nor did they create any damage or destruction. And that's why I call that informal sector is the mainstream of the economy. And therefore the inform and therefore the whole economic system and the economic pathway which was existing has failed. The business models have failed. And it's now time, the pandemic has given an opportunity to carve out a new economic pathway. And that economic pathway will build a whole economy of nurturance. We do not want a future of work and future of workers where you, you gain job and employment at the cost of somebody else's work and job and employment. But you know, you want an economy which is caring, which is nurturing. You know, a, a quick assessment uh, uh, with the onset of the pandemic showed us that 73% of the workers had lost their livelihoods. 63% of women workers had their food intake had reduced, which means the nutrition was, you know, diminishing. Um, asset erosion was happening. 35% of girls are now out of school. And you see increasing abuse and violence on women. They did not wait for the governments or the NGOs to come and help. They started innovating on their own because for the informal sector workers, work is a healer. That is how they bring security and safety for themselves. And so women switched over completely. A waste collector started working in the COVID hospital, uh, you know, as a janitor or as a sanitary worker, 
cleaning the toilets, cleaning the drainage systems without even bothering about when in a lockdown, when all of uh, the other people were sitting inside the homes, these waste collectors were going outside and, you know, cleaning, creating a safe and secure environment. They, they did not wait for a skill development program. I was asking them that, you know, did you know plumbing? Did you know how do you clean the clogged drainage pipelines? And they said, no, it was all learning by doing. We could not wait for somebody to come and train us. How would I feed my family? So I think the biggest learning has come from the informal sector that how I saw somebody was saying that youth unemployment, but if we, if the young people are going to wait for somebody to create opportunities, I don't think there will be future of workers. We have to start innovating on our own. Innovation has to be our coping strategy. It, innovation is a luxury for the formal sector, but I think for the, we, the informal sector workers, it's the coping strategy. <laughs> uh, I, I will give you hundreds of examples that, you know, how the, when the garment workers supply chain suddenly came to a grinding halt, they switched over to making PPE sets. And I was talking to them, did you know how a PPE set looks like? And they said, no, we did not know. But there were one or two young educated women. They went on the YouTube. They saw that, oh, this looks a very weird kind of a thing. We went to the market. We bought one PPE set, which costed them a thousand rupees, a lot of money for them. And that's how they learned how to make PPE sets. And now they make, you know, 100,000 PPE sets a month. And that's how the livelihoods have all been, you know, bounced back. Women, they all cook at home. So how do we convert them into, you know, women supplying and catering snacks and food items. There are 5,000 women for whom this has now, they, 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 they don't wait for platforms to be there so that they can take online orders. They created their own little WhatsApp groups and they started you know, taking photos and whether they were crooked photos or upside down photos, but they were still on the WhatsApp. People saw them, people started ordering. We had vegetable growers and the vegetable vendors. They did not fear the pandemic, you know, the infection. They all went and supplied vegetables to the containment zones. And that's how the lesson is that put technology into the hands of the informal sector and that to women workers, they will use it to their best um, use. And local decentralized supply chains function the large nationalized and global supply chains have all failed. I hope I answered your question. Yes, Riva, those are those are very very important points around the around the local local economy and, and use of technology. Uh, let me pose the same question to uh, uh, to Armin. Uh, Armin, you often talk about the the changing nature of work, the precarious the precarity of of work. So, uh, like more more in the in the global north uh, context uh, and and looking at uh, future you, th you you think that that is that is slowly becoming the norm and what actually that means for workers i don't think it is becoming the norm but i think we should be all prepared in the global north uh, for a very big spike in the demand for on demand labor that is moderated through platforms because people in the global north do not form uh, collectives to the same degree that um, Rima Ben was talking about in these informal groups. They do rely on less on human contacts and networks and more on interface with their screens. And so I think uh, because the pandemic has been so difficult for so many businesses, we, are we, are, we may be losing up to half of our small and medium businesses in Canada, which will change um, the main street of businesses, um, sorry, the main street of communities everywhere across the country um, and change what kind of job options are available through local um, producers. And we know that those businesses will be doing, the ones that have survived will be doing everything they can to lower costs. So I'm just gonna go back to the bargaining point. 
um, uh, bargaining PowerPoint. Um, there is a lot of, um, a, a not, does somebody have their, could somebody mute their phone? Okay, maybe not. Anyway, if, you, if you've got some conversations going on in the back, I would suggest you mute your phone. phone. Um, there, it would be really good if people understood that um, businesses are going to be looking for ways to cut labor costs. That's what they do in the wake of every recession. They look for just-in-time labor, and that has materialized very dif differently in every recession. But now we all have a smartphone in our pocket in the global north. So businesses will be looking at platforms as a kind of substitute for temporary agencies to pick up people just for the amount of work that they need, which will mean lower hours of work for employees um, uh, or contractors. And then the employees themselves will want to turn to the platforms to do a little bit more side hustle, the jobs that help them get through. So not exactly informal, but because they're paid, uh, but very precarious and irregular and no control because, the because of the way the platforms are organized, no control over your hours of work or your rates of pay or the fees that you pay to the platforms. And the third category is the consumer. The consumer also, because the consumer, a, a huge swath of Canadians and people around the world have lost hours of work and paid hours of work. And so consequently household income. And household income everywhere around the world is the major driver of uh, GDP, which all governments want to see restored to pre-pandemic levels and then starting to grow again. In Canada, the uh, share of GDP attributed to household spending is 57%. In the United States, it's 70%. It's somewhere in that range throughout the global north. And it is so important in China that it is uh, that China is starting to add public services to literally put money in people's uh, pockets so they have more spending power. So they're spending less on education and health and spending more on stuff because uh, that's the way they assume uh, their economy is going to grow domestically. So bearing that in mind, when the consumer doesn't have as much money because of the pandemic and turns to platforms to just do one task at a time for the cheapest, fastest, most convenient price, um, we are looking at um, a pandemic of reasons for more demand for on-demand work, which as I say, is the reality in the wake of every recession, but now maybe more normalized than we think uh, as we move from pandemic to recovery. And that bodes very poorly for bargaining power, unless, as Rima Ben was saying, uh, we actually demand that these platforms provide data to public policy makers so that we can see how the platforms are being used, so that we can actually uh, bring in algorithms that don't just serve front of house or uh, the clientele, but also serve the back of house or the workers so that they face both the people ordering the service, but also help workers that are uh, registered as workers make sure that their work meets labor standards. Because this is the one unregulated part of the market, and it is poised to grow more rapidly than any other part of the market. Um, for a range of white collar, blue collar and pink collar businesses. And so we need to make sure that they, these platforms are not working outside of the laws that we have to govern working conditions or else bargaining power will be crushed. And there is no union in the world that can um, offset that. Though we're, they're trying uh, with Uber, for example, but you've seen the story with Uber. They. Uh, miraculously got uh, the right to try and form a union and uh, a piece of legislation in California that put the onus on the employer, in other words, the platform, to prove that these were in fact employees, not just contractors, who were able to access labor law. And then in the last um, presidential election, there was a proposition in California that crushed that, overturned that legislation. So bargaining power is really where it's at. Um, and 
large companies will do everything they can and platforms will do everything they can to quash your rights as a worker and your access to whatever services are available. The last point I will add is that China not only is looking at improving the purchasing power of its citizens by offering more public services, but it is also eyeing the platform economy and dominating uh, market share globally in financial platforms and other types of platforms. And this is something that especially the global south needs to pay attention to. But certainly the competition is coming to a neighborhood near you, even in the global north, because they really do know how to dominate when they put their minds to it. Uh, while you are at, at it, uh, Armin, there's a question in the chat box. Maybe you can you can quickly answer this specifically for you. Which sector should youth employment efforts be focused on post pandemic? Um, there's no easy answer to that, but I can tell you that what has emerged from the pandemic as part of the essential economy, it involves work in the caring economy, work in the um, environmental economy, anything that kind of resuscitates the planet and also helps the energy generation and utilization uh, pivot towards a more sustainable future and work in the building and maintenance sector. So anything to do with infrastructure and housing and retrofitting. So three very large areas. But if you think about what is an essential economy, you need the planet to be functional. You need the caring economy to be functional and providing enough care for enough people to go about their business and do other things. And you need housing and food. So that is kind of it. That's the essential economy. Anything you find, any work you find, will be you will be guaranteed work in those sectors. But the nature of the work is just as important as what sectors to look for work and what kind of training to look for. I think training will be not as important as it was before the pandemic, because as I said before, I know it's hard to think about, but in the wake of the pandemic, we will be looking, especially in the global north, at very widespread labor and skill shortages. And because we had a labor and skills glut for about the last 30 years, employers were able to require a necessary certification, which is why everybody was encouraged to go and get a university degree, right? It was a way of the employer filtering out what they needed, showing that these people were hard workers. And that increasingly is going to be like, we'll take whoever we can get, we can, and some companies will even train them. Um, or people will be turning to micro-credentialing. Um, I'm not saying that that is your only route, but I'm saying that's more of a route than it used to be. And uh, there will still be a two-tiered elite versus non-elite group of workers. Those who have the time and money to get a full degree will begin to see again the premium on having a post-secondary degree. That does not apply to the kids today that are in school. This is going to apply to the kids in five years, in 10 years. Uh, the kids that are today in school that can't get work, and that's why they're in school, they will still face the same glut or surplus situation in trying to find work. It's going to be very brutal for that generation of workers and uh, young entrants to the labor market for the next year or two. Thank you. Thank you, Armin. And I, th this has come up again and again in our, in our conversation, the, the, the education and the skills and, and micro credentialing and, and how that that uh, is going to be more and more important going forward. Uh, Armin, you touched about, uh, uh, you talk, in, in both of your remarks, you talked about bargaining power. So uh, Rima Ben, uh, would you like to react? I mean, save us uh, decades of experience of, of actually working with informal workers uh, so that they can bargain uh, with with the market with the state. So any 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 le lessons, any reflections on that? What what everybody can learn from that? How does an informal worker bargain? Um, I'm sure everybody must be reading the or listening to the news that currently India has uh, experiencing farmers' agitation. Not a few hundred, a few thousand, but three, four hundred thousand farmers are all marching towards the national capital. That's the power. Um, that's the bargaining power. And a government which was so firm and adamant that it will not 
uh, listen to the farmer's demands unless they move to a certain prison kind of a place. And the farmers just did not concede to those kind of conditions. And because the numbers kept swelling, today the government has invited them for unconditional negotiation. And that's the victory. That's the bargaining power. And how did they get it? It was through organizing. I think organizing is the surest way to build the collective strength and the bargaining power of the informal sector workers. Uh, I think it gives you know um, a worker and it builds that inner self-confidence that I'm not alone, but there's a camaraderie of you know workers with me. And I think then it sets in motion this whole you know uh, path to building their own. Uh, self-confidence, their knowledge, their, their skills, and then they are able to tap into, you know, whether it's access to markets or access to capital or asset creation, access to healthcare. And when all these things start coming together, but at the pace at which the workers need, that becomes an empowering process for these informal sector workers. So I think organizing is the key there's no shortcut to organizing. And that's the surest way to increase the collective strength, the bargaining power. But as I think Armin was saying, you know, platforms have become the new public space now. And that's where the workers in the informal economy, and especially the women workers, we need to equip and enable them to feel secure and safe in that platform economy? And how do the workers collectively uh, increase their bargaining power in that platform economy is the new direction that the workers and their unions have to work on. Um, so I think uh, uh, also when you look at organizing, I think uh, uh, in, in the global South, agriculture will still for another decade or so be a major sector which will throw out immense employment opportunities. So agriculture with allied you know, um, sectors such as agro-processing, food processing. And so if I'm a small farmer and if I'm growing certain oil seeds, how I also do oil processing. And that's how I, and that means that, you know, I have at least a minimum income through the year and I feel that you know, my work is decent and also dignified. I think uh, when we say that a good job, what does a good job mean? It means that I need a dignity and you know, the respect. And once I start commanding that, then I think I'm able to move up and pull myself out of the vicious circle of poverty and indebtedness. Because I think our experience has shown that poverty is also a form of violence with the consent of the society. And it's that poverty, uh, we need to equip the workers and their organizations in their fight against poverty to earn dignity, to earn self-respect. Can I just jump in for a moment, please? Yes, yes, I mean, yeah. I, I just want to say I couldn't agree more with what Rina has just said. In the global north, we are losing the rules that help workers organize. We are actually actively breaking down the rules that help workers organize. So part of the admonition to workers or the encouragement to workers to organize and um, fight for their rights is making sure that the legal structures do not um, favor one side of the bargaining table over the other. And that's what we're fighting with, with platforms, but increasingly with the fact that um, in the wake of this and every recession, we get a, um, a phenomenon of the big fish eating the small fish, corporate concentration, which is gobbling up more and more market share. And the bigger the player is in a market, the more they set, they themselves set and change the rules. And um, let us be aware that our democratic processes are another way of organizing our rights. 
um, the democratic processes that lobby for and achieve better regulation and better legislation to protect those who are not the most powerful. Um, and let us never forget that the powerful are always lobbying to change those rules to work in their favor. And we have had exhibit A in the United States in the last four years, but we are certainly not immune to that in Canada and elsewhere. We have been lucky in this administration that says it says it has been focused in Canada on strengthening the middle class and those who wish to join it. Beautiful rhetoric that is not always matched by action. Uh, that is what we should be always looking towards is helping those who are in the middle and those who wish to join the middle from the bottom. I've said a hundred times in my career, our mission right now is to boost the economy from the bottom up. Um, and that is what will assure the most resilient growth. And in fact, is the meaning of the term inclusive growth. It's to bring those that are the most likely to not be included in, to the table mm -hmm. um, and let imagination and potential flourish for all. And we will all be lifted up by that. It, this isn't just a charitable exercise. This is an exercise in diversification of talent and potential. And that's what everybody should be looking for from a strictly macroeconomic point of view. Forget about all the great things that we do when we work together and how it changes people's lives. If you don't care about that, if you think that that's like a, you know, wear your heart on your sleeve, uh, liberal thing, view it as an economic potential enhancing uh, gain for all of society when we boost the economy from the bottom up. But to do so, we need structures, we need supports, and we need laws that ensure that bargaining power does not continue to accrue to the most powerful. And that's an endless fight. That's not something we win once and we walk away from it. We're constantly doing battle on that front. And that battle will be pitched in the wake of this pandemic because it was already so few big players, especially in agribusiness. I'm thinking about what uh, Rima is saying and thinking about how agribusiness is becoming increasingly a globally concentrated cartel of a small number of corporations. So as those corporations gain in strength, we are not only going to need to organize nationally, but we're going to need to organize workers internationally uh, to fight back and demand better from our elected governments, because these companies are bigger than most elected, uh, most, most uh, economies for which uh, political representatives are elected by their people. So we've got a big battle ahead. When, it, when I say bargaining power, it isn't just one of those like nice terms. It's like, this is the fight of our lives. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Armin. So Yogesh, um, by just what Armin then was saying, I think, uh, you know, what all, uh, I think in order to boost the economy from bottom uh, up, I think it needs bold actions. And I don't see any bold governments in this world or neither do I see bold actions by the multilateral agencies like the IMFs of the world or the World Banks of the world. They all want to continue functioning in that old fashioned you know, uh, frameworks. Uh, if we really want to boost the economy, bring about bottom up um, revival, it needs bold actions. You need to create funds which help you know strengthen the livelihoods. So you need to invest in livelihood recovery and resilience funds. You need to create new financial instruments and products. Who understands all this? You know, no, no economist in the World Bank or the IMF has any idea sitting in Washington what happens at the ground level in the global south in the informal sector. Um, so, and then, you know, in the Harvards and in the MITs, you bring out those alphas and gammas and betas, which only they understand. Nobody else in the world would understand what does that mean in the economic terms. And therefore, I think unless, you know, livelihood recovery and resilience funds are created across the globe, what different sectors 
the economy will not be strengthened, as Arneen was saying. And I, I fully agree that, you know, uh, we need to mobilize globally. And that's where I think we are setting up a global coalition on future of workers. And, you know, this global coalition will bring in all different stakeholders, the academia, the think tanks, you know, the, uh, the research organizations, the workers organizations. Oh. And everybody will have to together work on how do we increase the bargaining power. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Rima Ben. We have lots of questions coming in now. Uh, so uh, very soon we'll open it. But before that, Farooq has a question. Um, uh, thank you, Rima Ben. Thank you. Thank you, Armin. Um, I want to kind of go back to the beginning of the conversation in some ways. And I also want to address the elephant in the room, which you know we've spent a lot of time talking about in our course, and that is technology. And I think it's the appropriate metaphor to use because it reminds me of the story of the blind men and the elephant, right? Each one of us looks at the elephant, the technology elephant, and if you're holding the ear, you think it's like a fan, and if you're holding the leg, you think it's, it's a trunk. Rima Ben, you've always been very savvy in understanding the power that technology has and the interface between the work that you do in the technology. You mentioned very briefly, and I don't want it to get lost, the idea of taking ownership of the data that you have and how you can build better algorithms to be able to do better decisioning, to be able to uh, find more um, tailored solutions for, uh, for some of the challenges that you're facing. I know that you're doing a lot of incredible work in using technology at smallholder farm levels in ensuring that uh, you know farmers are able to make better decisions about application of fertilizers, et cetera, in, in, their, in, in their farms. And I know Armin has a slightly different perspective on this because she believes that in terms of the, the most immediate issues, technology is not necessarily something that we need to worry about. But if you can think about this from the broad perspective, the AI, the machine learning, the robotics, all of those things, I'd love to hear both your thoughts uh, on the question of technology, perhaps starting with Rima Ben and then uh, coming back to Armin. I don't want to have a debate between Armin and myself. Um, so I will be very mindful of that. Otherwise, everybody will watch the debate show that, oh my God, a wonderful show between the North and the South. And uh, that would also be interesting and fun. But I think uh, uh, at Seva, our experience has always been that, you know, when you put technology into the hands of the women workers, they know how best to use that technology to their advantage. So therefore, I think our first and the foremost is that there is no technology or technology solution, or there are no agencies that are currently working on technologies which are bottom up. Everybody is designed to help, you know, either the corporate sector or the workers in the formal sector or the educated middle class in the cities and in the urban areas. But uh, look at a shepherd and uh, his son, you know, who goes every day with a, a herd of hundred sheep and, you know, grazes them in the open, brings them. What kind of technology do they need? It's only us who would know what kind of technology would they need. No company, no Googles of the world or no uh, Facebooks of the world would be able to design an application which you know a cobbler will be able to use or a shepherd will be able to use or a, a weaver will be able to use. And I think that's where the power of data lies. That's where, you know, how do we have our own apps? So why do you need to use WhatsApp or why do you need to use Facebook? And that's where we are creating our own platform where we will have our own digital directory. We will have our own applications so that, you know, uh, a farmer in a particular agroclimatic zone would know that, okay, so many farmers have grown cumin or so many farmers have grown castor. This is the variety. And this is the area where they, there are castor mills. So how do we trade amongst ourselves? 
And that's where, you know, when I say that, how do you equip and enable the workers to deal with the platform economy? You have to build your own counter platforms. Why should I sell my products on Amazon? I can have my own platform where, and I don't need to sell to uh, the outside world. I can sell within the membership only. And that's how the local economy gets strengthened. That's how the employment gets generated. So that's the kind of, that's the power of technology. And that's how we have to equip themselves. And uh, why should I be watching Netflix all the time? I have nothing to do with Netflix. But that's what we are bombarding, you know, all unwanted information we throw into the hands of the young boys and girls in the villages, in the urban slums. But nobody knows what kind of content one has to generate for these youth. I read somebody has been writing that I'm writing report on youth and, you know, you borrow from what Armin says, put it in the report. No, the content has to be generated by those Young people, what is it that they want? Of course, Armin Ben would be an expert, but you know, we need to go amongst those informal sector workers and generate content which is useful to them. And that's where technology can do wonders. That's where technology can do wonders. And in this, in this pandemic, when there was a lockdown which was announced in with a notice of four hours, you know, everything came to a grinding halt. On the third day only, 4,000 of our grassroots leaders were all started using, you know, different smart gadgets. And we converted our trainings into e-modules. We started uh, having our conversations on Zoom, on Google Meet, on everything. So that's how, you know, the power of technology works. And this is how one has to increase the bargaining power. The government is now uh, working on distribution of vaccines and the government announced that they have data of old age people. They have data of, you know, people with certain disease. Where did that data come from? How do I bargain with the government on behalf of the informal sector? Only when I have my own data, which I can counter present, and that's how I influence the policies. That's the power of technology. Mm -hmm. I hope I answered your question correctly. Um, absolutely. And I think one of the things, if we have a chance to come back to, you know, you mentioned very quickly that you're looking at this sort of global center for research on the future of work. I know this is also an area where you believe that coming up with your own original data on what is happening is going to be a very important thing to, to be able to bring into the discussion. If we have a chance, I'd love to come back to that. But Armin, I know you have a different uh, perspective on this whole question of technology and the robots eating up our jobs. But if, if you can just share a little bit about where you see some of this going. Yes, I agree with a lot of what Rima Ben is saying. Um, I would caution that um, if everybody started creating their own platforms, you would lose the power of what social media is um, because it is about scope and scale. That's why people turn to Google. That's why people turn to Facebook. It's the biggest, it's the biggest community. And whereas you might not need it for work, people are social animals and young people in particular want to be doing what other people are doing. So hence the popularity of things like TikTok that older people would not be interested in it at all, but suddenly surged out of nowhere. So uh, the power of large platforms should not be underrated in terms of their appeal to people. There is nothing magical about the Uber technology. The reason it is dominant is because you can find it in every country. So it's like McDonald's for people that want convenience. Don't forget the, the, the value uh, Rima Ben talked about the value of technology and data to the employer and to the worker. In fact, what drives most platforms and most new digital technologies is the value to the consumer as convenience. So we are actually pitted as consumers against ourselves as workers because we're looking for faster, better, cheaper, more convenient and less commitment through these uh, platforms that permit us to find whatever we need very quickly and for the lowest 
possible price globally. Uh, these search engines help us get the cheapest, the fastest, the most convenient. And that's what everybody wants, especially when their, um, their livelihoods are being uh, cramped and they have time to look online. So yes, it is important to also break free of these things, uh, but often you're going to need open source data and that also is in contention. More and more the fight is over intellectual property and who owns the technology in the first place. Um, and so we are fighting battles on many different fronts to be able to create our own technology that isn't parroting other technology. Um, and that's why we need governments on our side. So when we also talk about uh, our own original data, um, we have statistical agencies um, in the global north that are supposed to work for the public good. And what we don't have as yet is governments demanding uh, data not proprietary data on the things that we do that are in real time from all these uh, providers as a right of doing business in that jurisdiction. But then we would need somebody to interpret that data and make it available to the public for the purposes of civic tech, for the purposes of public policy that governs this new field that right now is again, unregulated and designed to advance the interests of the owners of those platforms. So I think there is work to be done both through the cooperative mechanism. I love the examples Rima Ben has given about how technology be can be used by uh, micro units of production. But don't forget it's the macro unit of consumption that is driving the utilization of these big platforms. And so how we uh, how we collaborate as workers may be different than how we co collaborate as consumers. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I, I would put out that caution. The last thing I would mention is that open source technology and 3D printing um, and even some degree of algorithms and automation does make possible the relocalization of production in a way that we couldn't have imagined even five years ago. So that the global supply chain is what has made faster, cheaper, better, a possibility for a growing number of people. So we often measure progress in terms of income, but we have also seen major progress in the last 20 years in terms of consumer welfare. Who gets to consume what, um, for what price and how quickly? and for what quality. And uh, that has been, uh, it, it depends on what commodity or what category of consumption you're talking about, of course, but there has been a net gain in consumer welfare, which we don't measure all that terribly well. Um, but that has actually, as I said, pitted us as consumers against ourselves as workers. It has often come at the cost of somebody else's work being exploited for an even lower price with less control. So we are now in a position where there are a lot of technologies that can help um, create. We're going from an era of mass production and mass consumption to increasingly more custom ordered or what the, the term is these days bespoke, that I can order a pair of shoes online with the color, shape, design that I want, so long as it's available on open source and I can source it from wherever I want and it gets printed in my backyard. Um, similarly, 3D printing, of, like we're not there yet, but that's where we're heading, is more and more production, um, happening in our backyard, which does create jobs and does abrogate supply chains. It makes shortens supply chains and makes contracts actually shorter with the suppliers, which has got a good side and a bad side. So technology is doesn't work in just one direction. It works in more than one direction. And we have to keep our eyes open to when it benefits us as consumers, benefits us as workers, and benefits us as citizens. And technology can do all of that and more, but it can also take away from us in all of those instances and more. Thank you, thank you, Armin. I think there are a lot of questions coming up, so I'm actually gonna open up. Uh, Johnny, are you able to turn on your mic and, and uh, uh, make the point here? So Johnny is actually talking about cooperation in, in, in the digital economy. Johnny?
Hi. Hey, hey, Johnny, go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. No, so the the, uh, the points you were making in the chat, uh, Johnny, that how do you actually uh, when when you talk about bargaining and competing uh, platforms like Amazon and all, so you you you're talking about how do you actually create uh, cooperation uh, to compete? So you want to ask that question? Yes. Um, well, the the question that I really wanted to that I want. Thank you for for giving me the opportunity to ask the question. I I think there are some great ideas um, coming out of this, and I wonder. Um, how could uh, how, how could we think about bringing together folks to develop a more cooperative platform um, that would re that would respond to sort of the competition with the Amazon that is sort of profit driven, but a more cooperative one whereby you know workers or um, you know micro enterprises could. Uh, potentially uh, begin to create something where they can sell and trade their goods, which would then al allow them to sort of keep more of their profit as opposed to it going to, you know, big international companies like, like an Amazon. Because as, as, a, as a consumer, and as much as I recognize the challenges of, of giving my money to Amazon, the, very often I don't have any other alternatives. So how do we offer that alternative? Maybe Rima Ben, you you already have things going on in that direction. Maybe you want to sh share the e bazaar and, and other things. Sure, I'm so glad, Johnny, you um, posed this particular uh, question, and I think. Uh, in another six to eight months time, we would be able to share with you in um, and also in different countries in Africa as well, a platform uh, which, uh, you know, the micro enterprises, the entrepreneurs, the micro entrepreneurs or the workers themselves could use it. And that's how and it's, you know, how do you uh, contribute towards that and how do you share the profits as well um, and that's how we create our own platform so we are uh, we have digitized some two million uh, micro entrepreneurs right now so we know exactly what these entrepreneurs are making and so we are now creating a platform we are training a whole cadre of young boys and girls into a photo shoot into curating, into creative writing, barcoding, packaging, logistics, distribution. And that generates a lot of employment. And, that, and how do you do your own warehousing and uh, create your own distribution, logistics, everything. And once that uh, pilot uh, will throw out a lot of uh, pinching points, will throw out a lot of results, we would be able to refine it. And I was also reading that you were talking about the costs. And I think that's where, again, the bargaining power comes. When I tell a software company that, you know, we will be digitizing millions and millions, uh, how do you partner with us? And that's where you leverage, you know, your strength and make them design and develop the platform at a cost which is affordable by the workers and their unions themselves. And that's how we partnered with Microsoft and uh, a local IT firm to design the entire uh, platform. And once the platform works for you know, uh, producers and entrepreneurs in one area, it can then be taken to many, many other areas as well. So inshallah, maybe someday we will be able to have, uh, you know, micro enterprises and entrepreneurs from different parts of uh, the world as well use this platform. Great. Thank you, Rima Bin. Um, you, you had any reflections on that, that particular question, Armin, or can I jump to the next one? I think that there is lots of opportunity to create parallel systems and you're still gonna get the majority of people going to the Amazons because it's like as easy as Googling something it, where Google has become a verb. It's not even just a, uh, a search engine. So, uh, but 
you know, as time goes by, more people are gonna be looking for alternatives. So the faster we get going on providing alternatives, the better. I'm very struck by Rima's comments about how they're training people to get small entrepreneurs together on a platform where they're measuring what's going on, because it seems to me it is the same technology absolutely as what uh, Amazon does and it's for the people. So that's awesome. Um, but you know, there, there are challenges to doing that in Canada because of, um, uh, fights over who owns the processes and the algorithms and who are you getting to develop these, uh, websites. You, you do need, you need the same techniques and skills. It, you're just adopting it for different people for different purposes. Um, so that's where we're sh falling short is getting enough people that are willing to work in this area because they can make more money um, and get hired more readily um, in profit-making enterprises. So being able to offer people the jobs, having people that know what they're doing enough to offer people the jobs to create viable um, alternatives is really important and very challenging because all of us on this call, I bet none of us have got, other than maybe Rima Ben, <laughs> have got the skills to do exactly what um, we're talking about with re with respect to alternative and cooperative platforms. Mm -hmm. No, that's what I always find amazing of, of, of whenever I go, uh, whenever there is a challenge, I think Ilaben always says, I mean, so access to finance was a, was, was a problem initially yeah. when they were organizing, right? So they created their own bank uh, and, and that bank very well functions now. So there's always there, they are ahead of the game. And I, I, I'm <laughs> really looking forward to that e-bazaar when it comes and competes with, with Amazon. Uh, I, I have a question for you, uh, Armin. Uh, it's in the chat and it's one of uh, the, the students who was, who's attending our course and she uh, unfortunately had to leave, but uh, the question is here. And actually she used to work, uh, she's currently working at uh, SDC, uh, the e -E -S -D -C oh, yeah. employment. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, and her question is, one of the announcements uh, made by the government yesterday was to establish a plan for Canada-wide child care system. We will have to stay tuned for the budget 2021. From your perspective, what should a child care system in Canada look like? What would be the federal, uh, ro federal role versus the role of provincial authorities? I have written two documents on that. Uh, so I'm not going to try and ca characterize. Uh, both of them are fairly short, and you can see them on atkinson.com forward slash, slash, slash fellows. Um, one is invest in early learning, and the other is a year-by-year -year approach. Um, the federal role at this point in the um, at this point in the pandemic has to be to provide hundred cent dollars, not cost shared money to build up a system of high quality early learning. Unfortunately, yesterday they also announced $2.4 billion and more money into people's pockets, which is great for people that need more cash to buy childcare, but it doesn't actually create one extra space. And what it does is simply expand and extend what we already have, which is a mishmash of care that is primarily dedicated towards warehousing our children so that mommy and daddy can go to work which is not what we need for the future given population aging. So to build a system of early learning and childcare requires setting standards nationally for uh, uh, targets and outcomes that we want to make sure our children are learning ready when they enter school and learning supported when they are, are in school to minimize school dropouts and to maximize the learning potential of every child. And that requires trained early childhood educators. We know we have over a quarter century of scientific data that shows that the way we learn is established, it's hardwired in the first few years of life, often before we enter school primarily. So we know that this isn't just a happenstance, just having a babysitter is not gonna maximize your learning potential. And I'm not saying every child has to be like, boom, boom, boom. You have to learn how to learn until they get into school. We learn by playing. And there is lots of pedagogy that shows how you maximize learning potential in the preschool years. 
that requires training. And once you've trained these people, it requires compensating them uh, at a level where they don't leave the field. Right now, most early childhood um, educators and people providing care are paid just above the minimum wage. It's like I can get a better job after five years someplace else in a different field. So if you're going to train people, you have to compensate people. You have to provide people with the same supports that kids in school have because a lot of our youngest learners have got lots of issues, especially if they're recent, uh, if they're families of refugees or uh, families from very troubled families. Uh, children from very troubled families, where you're gonna need more, more resources than simply early learning educator training. Um, and that is available to kindergarten kids and up, but not to our earliest learners. So there's a, a structure of early learning that can be and should be put into place, identifying early learning uh, disabilities, uh, problems with hearing and seeing. These sort of things are, are not what early learning educators are trained for, but can make a world of difference if caught quickly enough with kids. And so that's what the federal government can finance to create in the course of the next five years. And then we can talk about how, and, and that would make them an equal partner with the provinces in the provision of this care. And right now they, they provide very little of this care, less than $2 billion worth in what the provinces are already spending, which is about $12 billion. So definitely not an equal partner. So we're looking at ways of, uh, of increasing federal uh, contribution, but making that money actually buy change and build a system of early learning rather than simply expanding access to the care that exists which by the way as we go through the pandemic because so many child care centers are operating at less than capacity and consequently not enough revenue to keep themselves open more uh, care centers are shuttering so we are left with the deepest pockets in the field which happen to be for-profit providers and most for-profit providers are parts of chains. In other words, these are for-profit chains that seek to generate dividends for shareholders, which is exactly what happened in LTC and exactly what we should be avoiding recreating in, in, amongst our earliest, uh, you know, our youngest uh, citizens. So we've got a lot of work to do to prevent things from getting worse. But the good news is it is possible, it is within reach, and there is a lot of interest in doing so. As, as, as the uh, question points out, it was just raised yesterday that that's where we're heading. So wish us all luck because this is the, we've been asking for this for over 50 years. On December the 7th is the 50th anniversary of the report of the Royal Commission on the Status of Women. And we have been asking for childcare officially for 50 years to be able to support women's equality in the workplace. And uh, maybe it's time has finally come. Mm -hmm. Ivavan, you had any reflections on that particular question? I'm mindful of time. It will be a okay. long reflection. <laughs> but I, <laughs> okay. uh, but I want more. to say, Armin, that you know, uh, it took you so long, I think, uh, that's why we always say we shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome, overcome someday. someday. Oh, deep in our heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. What a wonderful uh way to to, to end, the, end the webinar uh, uh thank you so much uh, i'll actually let uh, uh, jamie do the proper thank you but to the the participants for our uh, class uh, the class will begin tomorrow same time uh, eight o'clock uh, atlantic uh, so we will all see you there there is also a webinar uh, uh, the last webinar for this year we are actually planning to continue this webinar in 2021 as well for, for, for this year. We have one more final webinar uh, coming up at 10 o'clock local time. So see you all there. And to the class participants, see you at uh, eight o'clock. Over to you, Jimmy. Thank you. So I, I imagine I, I can share sentiments from many of you who are on the call in the webinar with us. 
my heart and my mind is full. And thank you so much, Rima Ben and Armin for sharing your thoughts, your expertise, your experiences with all of us. And uh, I'll be stepping away to think about these things very deeply in the context that we all live, whether we're in India, or we're here in Nova Scotia, and uh, we shall overcome that will stay and, and resonate with, with me very, very much. So thank you. I'm full of gratitude to you both. Uh, thank you to Yogesh and Farouk and Alyssa for bringing us all together and continuing these critically important conversations on the future of work and workers and uh, the experiences that we're learning together over the past number of years, as Yogesh mentioned at the onset of the conversation, uh, the lengthy history of the Antigonish movement. And as I'm seeing through the chat, the opportunities that we have today to embrace technologies and to put workers and to truly live into a human-centered approach to the future that we can collectively create together. Uh, thanks to you all. Thank you to the province of Nova Scotia through your ongoing support for the Center for Employment Innovation, to our many partners who are here with us today, not only in the classroom with Yogesh and Farouk, uh, but also who have tuned in over the past number of months as we've been exploring the future of work and workers and to the many others who have joined in as well. Uh, we see many friends and colleagues through our ABCD work and others uh, right across our connections with the Cody Institute and the Extension Department at St. Francis Xavier University. So thanks to you all. Uh, we appreciate your time, your commitment and your contributions to all of these important conversations. And hopefully someday we might sit around a kitchen table together. So Thank Jamie, you. you'll remember when you were at the Future of Work book launch, there was yes. a slogan, right? There was a hum. Yes. Okay. So maybe we should all turn on um, their uh, mics now. And I will say hum sub and you have to say ek hai. It means we are all in this together and we are we are one. So hum sub. Ek hai. Ek hai. Ek hai. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Be well. Thank you. Bye-bye, take care.